media team told me that I'm far too shiny. Um, so I said, haven't you read your Bible when Moses went up the mountain and came down? I've just been with the Lord all morning. So, so you know, I just need to kind of rub that off. Is that better? I should be told off now as well. Well, a few things first of all. We will understand what the latest announcements mean. Um, it was encouraging to have so many messages and queries. I don't know if Boris said it at 7.01, at 7.04, um, because that shows that really what we're doing here is important, and it really was nice. Usually the pattern is over the next few days, more information will come out, how it's interpreted, um, and we will meet as a team, the directors have appointed a group of people that will look into that and advise how we should go about, and we will communicate with you in good time. What does seem to be clear is that we won't be meeting like this next week. Um, that seems to be clear. And this morning, I, I'm sharing a sermon that I didn't plan to give, nor that I hoped I would have to give under these circumstances. But I think perhaps some of us could see it coming locally, if not nationally. So forgive me if it's a little rough around the edges, or a little unpolished, or even a little short. Now, if you really know me. As I, as I sat there listening yesterday evening, like most of you, I'm sure, I thought, not again. What's this going to mean for me, for my family, for our finances, for my life? What will it mean for church? As I said, a number of you contacted me. What's it going to mean? And as I just went to bed a few hours later on, one of the news agencies put up, church banned. Um, I'm sure they use that language sometimes to incite. And as I went to bed and I asked God, so what do you think? Because that's, that's a good place to start, isn't it? David inquired of the Lord, so what do you think? And I felt the Lord say, you can't ban my church. You can't close the church doors. No, 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 hold on. I'm not inciting we do something different. My church is not a building, God said. My church is not a meeting. And if one of the things I think God is doing through this time, one of the many things, is breaking down that view that you have to be seated within a building to be the church. My church, thank you, Andrea. My church are the ecclesia. My church are the people of God. We are the church. And we need to think sometimes when we wonder what the church is doing, because we are the church. And I went to bed with that ringing in my ears. As many of you know, I rise early. 5 a.m. is my usual time, although of late it's even been a little earlier. And as I sat there this morning and asked God, what do you want to say to your church this morning? So I want to speak today to God's church to the people of God, to a community of believers, and say, God's not dead. He is alive. God is not dead. He is alive. You can clap. God is not dead. He is alive. And I pushed it away. A, a song from my child, and as I pushed it away, it came back even louder. God is not dead. He is alive. Perhaps for some of you, you'll remember that song and I thought we'd sing it together and then realise that we couldn't. And am I actually going to try now? I'm not sure. But it's God's not dead. No, he is alive. God's not dead. No, he is alive. God's not dead. No, he is alive. I feel it in my hands. I feel it in my feet. I feel it all over me. And that's what God is saying this morning. And he took me back. My mum, who I know listens, somewhere there's an audio tape that we probably can't play of Kath Newnham singing that song with all her heart. That's my grandma who passed away many, many years ago. But instead of the statement, 
I feel it in my hands. Or instead of that, it became a command. Feel it in your hands. Feel it in your feet. Feel it all over you. God is not dead. And God said to me, we have a choice this morning. This is low. <laughs> it needs to be up a bit more. We have a choice this morning. And the glasses. We have a choice this morning as the people of God. We have a choice despite concerns for health, despite concerns for jobs, for finance, for family, for mental health, despite all of that which is very real, as the people who have the Holy Spirit, God himself living within us, you have a choice. Yes, please. You have a choice this morning. Do you know that you have God, God's Spirit, high over there, living within you. Do you realize that? You can say amen, providing you don't raise your voice. We have the Spirit of God, thank you ever so much. And we have a choice to sink down low, a choice to allow this to overwhelm us, a choice to withdraw, or you have a choice as the people of God to rise rise above all of that very real very real stuff it's like when we go on an aeroplane and it's always raining and 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 gray in britain and then we start to soar and we break through the cloud barrier and we see blue sky there it is and you know what god god can lift us up if we allow him god can lift us up if we let him above our circumstance above our challenges above our very real challenges that we have and take us to blue sky amen amen challenges with jobs challenges with mental health and we can walk in the power of god and his holy spirit above all of them, if we choose. Look where it starts. Isaiah 40, verse 31. This is where it starts, church. But those who wait on the Lord, just wait there. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength, They shall mount up with wings like eagles, there you go, above the clouds. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Those who wait on the Lord. Church, wait on the Lord this morning. Are you feeling weary? Are you feeling weak? Do you just feel like you can't keep going like this? You thought things were getting better and moving forward and you are holding on to that. I realize sometimes we hold on to those things instead of God. And then when those things are rocked, we don't know where we are. But sometimes we do. We hold on to the fact that things are moving forward, that there's a little bit of normality, that I've learned how to live with things. And now you're wondering whether or not you can keep going. Wondering whether or not you have the strength to go on. It's as if I'm ready to faint. Then let us back up a few verses from 28. This is Isaiah 40 again. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not grow faint. Amen. If you're feeling weak and weary and thinking, I just can't do it again, wait on the Lord and I said to God but not everybody feels that way for some they feel the exact opposite they see opportunities they're eager they're wondering how we're going to push forward and move on so I asked the Lord this morning what do you want to say to them and he took me to Psalm 46 verse 10 
Be still and know that I am God. Instead of interpreting be still as a gentle suggestion, the meaning in the psalm lends itself to more, to cease striving, to stop taking control. The people of God should interpret the command for themselves to read more like this. Snap out of it. Wake up. Let go of control. Acknowledge how awesome and splendor your God is. Be still and know that I am God. Then it caused me to ask, so what is the church, Lord? We're so fixed on it coming to a building. We go to church. We've heard it so often. What is the church? Some come to the church for relationship. For some of you, the only reason you're here and not down the road is because of good, strong relationships. And that's good. God places us in families, in community, in a body. But it's not what church is about. Some of us, we gather around a cause, meeting needs, overcoming injustice, helping the poor and those who can't help themselves. And some of you become terribly frustrated if you can't see where we're going and see how we're pressing into that. It is so good and it's so in the heart of God and it's what I was preaching on this morning originally. But it's not what church is about. It's a fruit of what church is about. I'm quoting from somebody, I don't know who, but they preached an awesome sermon on Ephesians 4. And they said this, and it wasn't me, as I just did this week. Church is about a community of believers who belong to and are gathered around Jesus by the Spirit who calls us and equips us to participate in the very work And the word of Christ. Amen. Mark 12, 30 to 31. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. They went on to say, we are a community that have been redeemed by Christ and empowered by his spirit to reflect his love to a world in which he died for. The continuation of Mark 12, 31. And the second like it is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. It's from this place, seated around Jesus, learning and living in such a way that all our love and all our focus is upon loving him. Because in some strange way, when we give everything towards that goal we find ourselves healed, sozoed, whole. We seem to find strength and ability and space to reach out towards others. But often we focus on the reaching out and wonder why we're tired and exhausted. Look at, it's not in notes here, but look at when Jesus spoke to the woman at the well. It's implied in scripture that he sends his his disciples off to get food. And he starts to minister to somebody that as a Jew, he had no right to speak to. He ministers to her. She goes off and she evangelizes the whole of the town and comes back. And his disciples come back and says, here's the food you asked us to get. He says, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, no, no, no. You have food. Uh, Sorry, I've had food of you know not what. I've been fed through the serving and the ministering to somebody in need. Amen. Amen. Sometimes it feels like we talk more about the next program, activity, how we're moving forward, what's the vision and where are we going, rather than it's from a place of seated around Jesus that everything else flows from for those of you who feel overwhelmed wait upon the lord for those of you ready for the next challenge be still and know the awesomeness of god everything flows from a community of believers seated around him And those things we talked about are very real fruits of the gospel that any living ecclesia you would expect to see. But they're a result of, not the meaning for. And for both of us, 
from that place of Christ, we move forward. Whether you are fearful and need to wait, whether you're eager and need to be still, we move forward. Move forward into what? I ask God. Loving in. John 13, 30 says this. No, John 13, 34, 35 says this. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, by the love you have for one another. Don't, don't dismiss this as fluffiness. It is anything but fluffy. God gave his life for the love he had for me and you. He gave his life for love. It is not fluffiness. It is the most serious thing we can seek to strive for is to show God's love towards one another. I wrote down, please don't get lost now. I want you to realize the significance God places on you loving one another. Because out of that love comes a willingness to be in unity. And if you're following the teaching we're doing on Ephesians, I got a bit excited. I was supposed to do the whole of chapter 4. And I said to Andrea, I can't do the whole of chapter 4 in half an hour. I just can't. It's too dense. It's too good. So I took less than half an hour to do the first 17. And if you've been following that, the teachings at all emphasize Paul's desire for the people of God to be in unity. And he says, you've already got that unity, but you need to actually work at keeping it and holding it. Because the significance of being in unity as God's people is huge. Look at the Tower of Babel. When God comes down somewhere in the Old Testament, he says, oh my word, they're of one mind. Is there nothing they cannot do? Misplaced unity caused God to have to disrupt their language. Imagine right-placed unity in Christ. The church of God becomes unstoppable. Amen? Okay, let me just catch up. Um, yes. Out of this place, out of a close-knit tribe, people see our love and know about Christ. A close-knit tribe that doesn't become a clique. Only God can do that. <laughs> Only God can actually cause people to be so close, but also so open at the same time. It's why he needs to be at the center of the source of everything we do. Hold on, which way am I going? This way. Let's have a look at this scripture. I have no idea why I put this scripture on, but Galatians 6, 9 to 11. Ah, yes. <laughs> and let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially those who are of the household of faith. Now, you can twist that to be, some, to be something that excludes people. It does not. Do good to all. But if we can't get it right in here, if we can't be in such unity and such love with one another in here, if we can't reach out and help and support one another in here, then how are we going to do it to a world out there? It becomes shallow and it's the world's way of doing it. When we're rooted in God and living it out in here, it just naturally spills over. We don't even need to try. Now is the time to gather together in your household, in your bubbles, in your small groups over Zoom, and come together to be seated around Christ, to wait and be still before him. You see, we're not where we are back in March. My goodness, do you remember that first Facebook Live where I kicked the camera and I dad danced to the nation? My goodness, praise the Lord we didn't do that again. Do you remember the first Zoom stuff and you'd miss the 40 minutes and all of a sudden it would stop and you wouldn't know what to do? We aren't there. We know so much more. Everyone in Solio Christian Fellowship can be in a bubble. Everyone should be in a triplet or a small group. 
This is not time to be on your own. You and God are not enough. Where did you get that from, Ben? Think of G Genesis. It is not good for man to be alone. I mean, gosh, man, there's no sin in the world, okay? The fall hasn't happened, and God looks, this is good, this is good, this is good. And he looks down and he sees man, Adam, Adam, humanity, and says, man, uh, it's not good that way. I need to do something different. Some of you are not in a bubble. You need to allow God to place people on your heart and you need to invite them into your home and welcome them to become your bubble where two or more are gathered. For some of you who live on your own, you might be waiting to be invited into a family's bubble. I felt the Lord say, seek the Lord, let him put somebody on your heart and phone them up and say, would you like to be in my bubble? Some of you are in a strong bubble already. Both of you are strong and grounded in the law. Lord. I want to encourage you to prayerfully consider whether or not you're strong enough to change that bubble and to reach out to somebody more in need. So that those who are in the most need can be connected with someone else in some way. And this is where the rubber hits the road. Because we tend to choose to be around those who we get on with. And I'm sorry, you know, the, the, the deep challenge with 200 people in the church is that you won't get on with somebody. Absolutely. And again, if you're following our teaching on Ephesians, it's not supposed to be that way in the kingdom of God. When you enter into being God's people, this whole idea of I don't get on. I mean, gosh, God brought the Gentiles and the Jews together and said, in me, work it out. Look what Luke 6, 32 to 34 says. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive back. In the kingdom of God, we reach out to anybody and all. In fact, it's so easy to connect with people who remind me most of me. I really get on with you because you remind me of me. And maybe there's a challenge, actually, who should we invite into our home? Who should I invite into my home? Ra rather than who am I comfortable to be around? I want to renew the call to call. You see, and this is where it hits the road, because many of you might say, that was great this morning, and go and do nothing about it. I mean this with as much love as I can possibly say. But last time when we really got into the flow of calling, I'd meet with some of you and say, so who are you calling? And you'd smile. And you know... In the early days, it was really easy to call, and I'd gone into the pattern and the flow, and I'd be reaching out to lots, and then slowly as I got busier, I'd call less, and I got out of the habit. Do you know what it is to receive a call? A call means you've had to find the time. A text means I can do it whenever I'm ready. 5 a.m. in the morning, I can send a text. You wouldn't appreciate me if I called you at 5 a.m., a call tells me I've made time. A knock on the door to stand two metres away or at the end of the driveway means actually you are so important to me, I wanted to find time to come and connect with you in the right way. Don't just phone those in your home group. You'll see them every week over Zoom. Don't just phone those in your triplet. I don't even know if we can, but you'll go for a walk with them at some point. This is a version of the table. If we can't welcome anybody in from our own church, let alone the church of God, then how are we going to do it with all sincerity 
for those who are not following Christ yet. Loving in. Galatians. Let us all do good. Let us do good to all, especially to those who are in the household of God. Loving out. We cannot close the doors of our church to people. And I don't mean the doors of the building. Be like that man that Andy Worthing talked about, who could not deny Christ and willingly went back to prison. As an evangelist, he cut off all avenues to share the gospel. What was he to do? His gift gone and realized speaking down the toilet carried his voice into every cell. It's so easy to focus on what we can't do and yet we miss what's right before our very eyes. You are the church in every home and in everything you do. You do not do it as yourself. You do it as part of the ecclesia. There is no, I'm not sure what my church is doing. There is only, I know what I can do and I'll find out what we're doing corporately. I know what I can do. Whatever I find in my hand to do, I'll do it with everything I possibly can. Some of you who, some of you have needs that will need to be supported in your bubble, in your small group, but also recognize, uh, this is where I put it, that Jesus was spiritually fed as he fed others. You can be healed through reaching out to others instead of only focusing on getting our own needs met. Amen? If we can open for private prayer here, then we should. If we can deliver food bags to those in need, then we should. But do not be blinded by what we can't do from your own home, from your own family. There is still a community right out there. If you're at home, look out of your front window. There is a community right on your doorstep that needs to know Christ as their Savior and Lord. And actually, God wants to encourage you that you are the very vessel that he wants to deliver his love to those that don't know him. This is talking, this is talking about what we do on the inside out. Do you remember last week, that word God gave us? What you do on the inside uh, of the bridge, God wants to declare on the outside. Here we go, we talked about not allowing, bringing people into the bridge to become a bottleneck to meeting people. Well, now potentially we can't bring people to the bridge in the same way. We'll understand that during this week. But you can go out. Yeah, but Ben, I can't, I can't. Look for those opportunities. I really hope they reinstigate the NHS clap. I had such good conversations with my neighbours. And you know, when it stopped, I stopped having those conversations. I haven't gone over the top. I haven't beat myself up. But I repented for being short-sighted for an opportunity laid down that all I could see was, well, that stopped now. You know what? I believe we've all got the ability to be entrepreneurs. God says, Ben, find a way. Find a way. You've got something so precious inside of you to keep it closed and in is almost criminal. Let's give God's love away. Let them know, your neighbours, that you're praying for them. Set up a separate email address. Praying for you in Darwin Road. That's my road. At gmail.com. Yes, some people will not do it for fear of security, but some might email you their prayers in. Tell people where you live and push a, a note through the street, through the, the, their door. I'm praying for you. What needs do you have? Think about the lady that you know who struggles to get out at the best of times and see if they need a food parcel. Bring them along to private prayer at your church. Offer them a food bag. 
but follow it up. Loving in, loving out. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second like it is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we're not where we thought we'd be just last week. But you always knew. You still have a message. You still have an encouragement to bring to your church. Lord, let us look up at this time. Let us do good at loving in so we can more easily love out. Father, I am so grateful that I do not have to do this on my own. I am so grateful that we do not have to do this on our own. Father, you are always there, never engaged, never too busy to talk. You are my great support. You are my source, my soul, my life. I'm so grateful you're in my life. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.